So we are going to get started. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. I, have, I do have a mic there, but my dad told me once that I was meant to be a public speaker before they invented PA systems, and he would always go shh. So, so I'm. Um, we're going to introduce ourselves, and then we'll talk about the procedure and the procedure for both past, um, amending the Constitution and the procedure for what we're doing tonight. And that ding ding that you hear means that the House is having a roll call vote. The House is um, right now dealing with paid family leave, and they are, will probably have at least 20 more roll call votes tonight. And every time they have one, it takes them about half an hour. They'll be here all night. There are 150, there are 150 people. So I'm Jeanette White, and I chair the Senate Government Operations Committee. This is the Senate Government Operations Committee. I represent the Wyndham District, which is down by the Massachusetts New Hampshire borders. I'm Allison Clarkson. Uh, I represent, I'm one of the senators representing the Windsor County District, and we're missing Chris Bray, who's quite ill, and he represents Addison County instead, but he's not able to be with us. Hi, I'm Anthony Killeen, I represent Washington County. Brian Collimore from Rutland County. So um, the way we're going to do this is, um, first of all, I, I would remind everybody, if you have a cell phone, to turn off your cell phones. Um, they tend to be a little annoying when people are trying to speak. So just so that you know the procedure for uh, amending the Constitution, our founders made it a little bit difficult to to amend the Constitution for good reason, because it is um, the framework of our values, and it shouldn't be changed willy-nilly. There are states that have constitutions that are pages and pages and pages long, and they do it by voter referendum, which um, oftentimes those changes are written by advocacy groups or lobbying groups, whatever and they change the Constitution and sometimes people are, when they go to vote, they're voting on 20 or 30 constitutional changes that are many, many pages long. We don't do it that way. The way ours works is every four years, so kind of every other biennium, you can introduce a constitutional change. So this biennium, 2019-2020, is when constitutional changes can be introduced. We, they don't have to meet any deadlines except that they have to pass out of both the Senate and the House by the end of May of 2020. In the Senate, they have to pass by 20 votes. There are 30 of us, so it isn't just, and it isn't um, two-thirds of the people that are there, it's 20 people. So if only 20 people are there the day that the vote is taken, it still has to pass by 20 votes. It then goes to the House where they can't make any changes, but they have to pass it by a simple majority. It then comes back the next biennium. So in 2021-2022 biennium, it will come back and it has to pass the um, Senate by just a simple majority at that time, and the House by a simple majority. If it meets all those uh, steps, it then goes in the um, general election of 2022. In November of 2022, it will go out to the entire population for a vote, and it has to pass by a simple majority. Then <clears throat> there won't be another chance to introduce a constitutional amendment. Uh, a proposal until the 2023-2024 biennium. So it's only every four years that you can introduce it. So I hope that explained a little bit of how, how difficult it is to change the Constitution and why when we do change the Constitution, we take it very seriously because as uh, was pointed out today, um, and in, issue. The, we've been living with this Constitution for a couple hundred years, 
And any change we make, we'll probably be living with for the next couple hundred years because it is hard to change. So given that, um, what we're going to do is, <clears throat> I know that we had um, said that two minutes and that's the way public hearings work. Let me explain a little bit for those of you who might not know the difference between a committee hearing and a public hearing. All of our committee hearings are open. Our agendas are on our website every week. So we've held this on our agenda, I think it's five times up to this point on our committee meetings. All of those are open. Anybody can come in, ask to testify, speak to us. And the value of doing it that way is we can have a dialogue back and forth. It's much less formal. We sit in a small room and there are the five of us around a table and whoever is talking to us and we have a dialogue. Public hearings are very different. Public hearings <laughs> tend to be more people come and want to testify. So it's usually limited to two minutes each and there's no conversation back and forth. It isn't a dialogue at all. It's just you, the public, telling us what you feel. Am I doing okay so You're far? You're doing really okay. Really so, we, um, what we have done is um, we had no idea how many people to expect. We weren't sure at all. So, um, we did limit it to two your conversation or your testimony to two minutes. That's the normal um, process for public hearings. And normally we have this little timer here, and Allison would do it, and when it gets to zero, I don't know if it's apt or what, but she'll, she'll do something and tell you that you're done. And, but um, given the fact that there aren't tons of people here, we won't use the timer, but we would ask you to keep your, um, your, convert, your testimony not too long, just because um, we don't know if other people might come who will want to testify. We also um, the, have done this in the past where we give you a, a little ticket and we figured that that's the fairest way, yes, <coughs> the fairest way to make sure that people are heard and that we're, it isn't just whoever comes first gets to speak and those who come later don't. Um, we will do the little tickets here until we run out of tickets and then we'll just invite people to speak if we still have time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And when you speak, if you'd be kind enough to give your name and the town you're, you uh, live in, that would be great. Yes, we would like to know that. So, um, let me just tell you a little bit about where we are now and what I think was one of the primary um, reasons for uh, the proposing the amendment in, in the uh, first place. Although I didn't, I am on the amendment, but I didn't write it, so I'm kind of guessing as to what the primary reason was. The Constitution um, is clear, it says, after arriving at the age of 21. And I think that many people interpreted that to mean that slavery was actually permitted until the age of 21. What we've learned in our um, meetings, and uh, we've heard from a number of people, a couple of constitutional scholars, among them Peter Teachow from the Vermont Law School. And what we've learned is that that, in fact, did not relate to slavery. It related to indentured servitude. And in most states at that time, you were free from your indentured servitude at the age of 30. The Vermont Constitution, when it was written in 1777, said <coughs> um, men were free of their indentured servitude at age 21 and women at age 18. Then in 1994, we um, made the Constitution gender neutral. Because we made it gender neutral, we had to um, raise the age of women being freed from indentured servitude to 21, the same as men. So that's what we have learned so far about the, the um, 
phrase after the age of 21. And we've found no, um, we know that slavery existed in Vermont. We absolutely know that. We've found no bill of sale that was uh, acknowledged for either an adult or a child. So our understanding is that it, while it existed, our framework said that this is our value and it should not exist. So with that, um, should we get started? Let me go for the best though. Yeah. So I'll call out names, <coughs> sorry, numbers. <laughs> I'm assuming I will have to use the last three numbers. Yes, <laughs> good idea. And so I'll, I'll do one and then just to let the next person know that they're in line, I'll call out the next number. So the first person to come out should be 134, followed by 136. <laughs> yeah, come on. Are you 134? Yes. Yes, please. And no, you, you don't, don't need to redeem your ticket. You can keep that for your <laughs> that's your, that's your <laughs> So if you just bring that down, sort of, yeah, you don't need to be too close to it because there's so people can hear you. But it's for the people who are behind. Because okay. you're projecting to us, so they can hear you. So. Okay, hopefully they can just go all right. I think you can move a little closer. Okay. Yeah, if you bring um, your chair, that'd be great. My name is Nadahe's daughter, and I'm a, I live in Cabot. Would you, do you know how to spell it? No. N E T D A. AG, and I've been seeing you folks at a previous committee yeah, yes. meeting. Yeah, hi. Um, so and you're in Cap. I'm in Cap. Yeah. Right. Um, so I'd be brief and to say that I, I support an amendment change to, to take away the, the uh, terminology of slavery, but also um, I would hope that the committee would uh, be bold in um, outlawing any language that allows. Um, enslaving somebody or stealing somebody's labor in any form, way, shape, or form. I think to not do so uh, goes against the values that we do sort of stand for and, and often pride ourselves on as a state. And I think it's, a, it's really a matter of um, criminalizing poverty. I'm gonna take a minute just to say that like I grew up in Vermont, um, the child, I had an incarcerated parent who spent 30 years in prison, who worked full time his entire life, my entire life of 30 years, and I don't think he ever made more than a dollar an hour. At that time, he was never able to contribute to our family uh, income on the outside. And I remember not even having graduated high school and being in a position to try to work, to save up money to buy 15-minute chips on the phone that were overpriced to benefit the phone companies. Um, and, uh, so you know, my ability to save, my ability to contribute to the state, to pay taxes, to you know, let your imagination go wild, right, has been stunted by what really is like a horrible form of uh, corporate welfare, you know, that takes not only the time and, and energy and value from people, but, you know, our relationships with each other and, and the rest. And so I would really just hope that we would not just uh, take this opportunity to have it be about language, but to really um, conceive of what we can do to be true to our ideals. <coughs> in the previous committee meeting, meeting that I was in, I'm forgetting which one it wanted to be, but I, I think it was one of you that said something to the effect of like, um, you know, these changes are hard to make and we don't want to have to go back and change again, so we might as well make a change that really is true to what we want and feel. And I feel that to do this is so, and that we could actually be bold and, um, you know, have a, a stiffer understanding of things than the, than the federal 13th Amendment which allows people to be enslaved in prison. And we can choose to not have that happen in Vermont and to Vermont. Thank you. Thank you. So 136 is up next, followed by 133. And I apologize for <coughs> coughing. I didn't go home. I probably should have. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Christine Malmore. I live in Burlington. I've spent most of my life um, living in, in Burlington after moving here with my family. And uh, I'm biracial, for lack of a better term. And I think it's, you know, as I was listening to you describe the reasons for, you know, maybe considering not doing this um, and the difficulty around changing the Constitution. This strikes me as kind of a strange reason not to do this. 
And I think that that kind of, it should shed light on the difference between, you know, the perspective of somebody like me that's of color and your perspective. And I think that that's really important to consider. And I think that if that's the only reason that you're thinking about not doing that, it doesn't really seem like much of a reason for me. And the only other thing I guess I'll share with you, because I could probably sit here for hours and talk about what this means to somebody like me. But as we were driving down here, I was just remembering the first time I ever had to explain to my children what slavery was. And it's a really difficult conversation. It's also really difficult to explain to like, you know, my brown sons that, especially in the state of Vermont, that if they ever come into contact with the police, that they're gonna have to be extra careful not just careful, but extra careful because they're brown, and it could be very easy for them to end up in jail even if they just said the wrong thing. So I hope you can understand like the, our perspective about why something like this is important. And I also think that most people really don't understand because you have to do a lot of research to understand uh, the far-reaching implications of having slavery in the Constitution, including criminalizing poverty. I spent 12 years at the CJC in Burlington um, assisting people that were returning from the prison system to find employment, and it was very difficult. It's especially difficult for you know, a white man or a woman, even in the state of Vermont, to find employment with a criminal record. It is next to impossible for a black or brown person to find employment, or at least decent employment with a criminal record. So I think that anything that we can do to start decriminalizing issues that are like, you know, addiction or other issues that really most other civilized places in the world don't incarcerate people for, I think that that's something to consider. Um, and back to my story about explaining slavery to my children, one of the things where I got stuck was when my daughter asked me if it could ever happen again. And I said, probably not, but I couldn't really say that with confidence. So I guess that's really all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you. Up next is 135, to be followed by 132. One, no, 133. 133. Yeah, yeah followed by 135. Correct. <laughs> I'll be fired for this job before. We're a little better with concepts than numbers. Thank you. Thank you for this hearing. Uh, my name is Wafi, W A F I C. Last name Faour, F A O U R. Richmond, Vermont. Richmond? Great. Yes. Thank you again. I am not a scholar of the Constitution, and I cannot answer the professor from uh, Vermont State why this excuse he gave about the language of the Constitution that we have to keep this language in this Constitution. And I don't find it very hard to take this language from the Constitution. Even the founding fathers put it, made it very difficult to change it. After all, we know in 2019, slavery is wrong, but the founding fathers <coughs> were owners of slaves. What concerns me the most that this language and this kind of relaxation about it, that it's all right to have it, when we have now and witnessing more and more the modern way slavery, I see it the treatment of people of colors, mainly black people, all through history, Jim Crow, and on putting black people in huge numbers in prison, stopping them here on this state, more at 67% on our biggest city, more higher than white uh, commuters, <coughs> putting them on jails and transfer them to uh, private jails, which is any one of you, if you can look at the documentary, like 13, named after the amendment, 
of the Constitution. We found multinational big American company are using the labors of the people on jail for less than one dollar a day. This is modern day slavery. And our silence about what's happening to our sisters and brothers here in rural area Vermont on our farms. They are living on fear day after day on the shadow of the bonds that they have no say of what tomorrow can bring to them. And us here on the house of the government, on the state, we cannot protect them. This is what concerns me. And we shouldn't be take this language as an easy language for people of colors or their any kind of people. You have to understand there is big percentage of people living in the state of Vermont. They feel as others. If you are not white, you are others. Even though if you came hundreds of years from the beginning of the state, from the beginning of this country, you still consider as others. You don't belong. We succeeded last week that we passed H.3 to change the education. But there are other areas we are not touching. The housing, the health care, and we have to look again and again on the policing on this state. Because how much we think we are liberal and open-minded, the treatment of people of color on this state is very dangerous. And this is 2019, and we have to work together. Thank you. Thank you. 135. So I just, I think I need to, I think I made a bad explanation at the beginning. I didn't mean to imply that because it was difficult and this language was in there that has been interpreted in a different way, that we shouldn't change it. I didn't mean to imply that it shouldn't be changed. Um, I was trying to give an explanation of what we've learned about the intention of the language to begin with, but I have no, no doubt that it should be changed in some way. So I just wanted to make that clear. I guess I should go give my testimony. Yeah, Did you say who was up next after that? 132. <laughs> I should, Mark just handed in his testimony. If anybody else has written testimony that they would like to give us at the time or submit later, please feel free to do so. Don't embarrass me. Mm -hmm. Please provide a copy to me as well for the record. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. We'll, we'll give it to you. Yeah, yeah, I got an extra one right here. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Madam Chair, Senate Government Operations Committee, my name is Mark Hughes for the record. And <clears throat> from? I'm from Burlington. Sorry, Senator. Oh, that's okay. It's good to see you all again. And uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to come out and, and be a part of the hearing tonight. I'm the Director of Justice for All and also the coordinator of the Racial Justice Reform Alliance. Uh, we brought you Act 54, uh, Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice System Advisory Panel. We also brought you Act 9, uh, Racial Equity Panel and Director. <clears throat> the Attorney General and the Human Rights Commission uh, Act 54 Task Force report it stated, quote, while slavery has been outlawed in this country for over 150 years, the vestiges of it and of Jim Crow remain today in the form of systemic racism. Act 9, quote, 
It created within the executive branch the position of executive director of racial equity to, quote, identify and work to eradicate systemic racism within state government. These were both done in 2017 and 2018, respectively, as you all know. Now we bring you PR2. <coughs> as introduced and sponsored by all of you, as well as 19 additional senators, the purpose of this bipartisan bill was to amend the Constitution, quote, of the state of Vermont to eliminate reference to slavery. And the purpose of the original proposal went on to say, quote, eliminating reference to slavery in the Vermont Constitution will serve as a foundation for addressing systemic racism in our state's laws and institutions. Now, we've, we've all come to understand that uh, through, uh, though well intended, are, are pleased to uh, remove slavery, quote, remove slavery, uh, from the Constitution, they, they kind of fell a little bit short of our collective intention to uh, ensure that the Constitution actually expressly prohibited slavery. I think we can all agree upon that. <clears throat> our purpose, however, remains clear. That is still, quote, to serve as a foundation for addressing systemic racism in Vermont. I'm asking that the essence of this intent not be erased. I'm asking that it be restored in the purpose of the language that we're moving forward. I'm asking that you do so along with the history of the partial prohibition, as well as that of the 13th Amendment that was in the original language, the 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution. Second, I ask you to consider removal of language indicating, quote, or bound by law for payments, debts, damages, fines, costs, or the like from the Vermont Constitution. This language, it supports the criminalization of poverty. Title 13, 7180, is clear on the fact that incarceration is a remedy for failure to pay fines, costs, surcharges, and penalties, end of quote. Again, Title 13, 7180, is a remedy, I beg your pardon, states that it is a fact that incarceration is a remedy. Incarceration is a remedy. For failure to pay fines, costs, surcharges, and penalties, that's a quote, okay, ominously familiar to that of the Constitution. <clears throat> the United States Constitution is even clearer that those incarcerated for punishment of crimes are slaves the 13th Amendment. Now, outside of federal implications, the implications of these types, uh, this type of servitude amounts to, uh, here in the state, nothing less than modern day trafficking. Finally, the wealth of whites being 13 to 1, 13 of that of African Americans, clearly the impact is going to be disproportionate on people of color. Now, third, and moving on to chapter two of the Vermont Constitution, the words freemen, quote, F-R-E-E-M-E-N, -E -E appears in our Constitution. And free women, F-R-E-E-W-O-M-E-N, end of quote, they appear in chapter two Section 42 of the Constitution, um, as descriptors for eligible voters in the constitutionally mandated general referendum required to amend the Constitution that you, Madam Chairman, explained at the top of this meeting. 
Now, they should be replaced with, uh, quote, maybe voters' qualifications and oaths or, or words to that effect, clearly. And I'd also ask you, as we focus on systemic racism in our Constitution, to note that the terms freemen and free women also appear 16 additional times in Title 17, <coughs> Section 32. And the term also appears in Rule 84, your rules, this in. <clears throat> All occurrences, ominously, they pertain to voter qualifications in the general referendum to amend the Constitution of this state. I ask that they be replaced. And lastly, it'd be irresponsible if I didn't provide some clarity surrounding the premise that the language, the Constitution probably never intended to prevent slavery uh, is floating around here. Uh, just a little clarity on that, if, if I might be permitted. <coughs> you see, Jacobs versus the Vermont Supreme Court was not a decision on the question of constitutional intent surrounding slavery. It never was. You see, the case was about a Supreme Court judge who owned and employed a slave named Dinah for 17 years. Windsor brought a claim against this judge because the town was caring for her. And being homeless, and she was blind and sick at this time, by the way, because Jacobs wouldn't do it. Now, after Jacobs' recusal, the purchase receipt was challenged, and Judge Tyler stated that the purchase receipt was inadmissible because slavery was prohibited in Vermont. This is arguably one of the worst court technicalities in Vermont history, and a far cry from a decision on constitutional intent surrounding slavery. With all respect to Mr. Teachout, his premise is poorly placed. This time, this is a time, rather, where there's a lot of stuff coming to the surface in this nation, okay? And there's a lot of stuff that we need to unpack. We need to do it together. Southeast State Correctional Facility is six minutes drive from Judge Jacobs' house, 70 State Street, Windsor, Vermont. That's where Dinah lived for 25 years. <clears throat> a woman, black, a slave, sick, disabled, homeless, unemployed, uninsured. She represented almost all of what society has historically neglected, abused, oppressed, and criminalized. Let's use her legacy to embrace the history, and let's commit to, to the future of this state. Now, we can't go on just criminalizing black and brown and poor folks, okay? This is our opportunity to make a clean break. Let's stay the course. Let's continue the work that we started. Let's continue to live up to who we are as Vermonters. Whether it has been immigration, cannabis legalization, the fight for women's rights to choose concerning their own bodies, nothing has deterred us here in Vermont for our fight for what is right. Let's continue to fight against oppression and criminalization of black and brown and poor folks in this state. Thank you for your time. Thank you, 132, to be followed by 137. Hello, I'm Zoe Hart, uh, resident of Shelburne, Vermont. H-A-R-T. H-A-R-T. And so, Z-O-E. 
I want to thank the committee for holding this hearing. I'm here to speak out in support of Proposal 2, the proposal to amend the Vermont Constitution to eliminate reference to slavery. In particular, I would ask that the committee send the proposal to the floor with the language as originally proposed by Senator Ingram and the other sponsors. The language originally proposed is straightforward and clear, and I believe represents who we are as a people today. <coughs> Nobody would read that language today and say, oh wait, we forgot to mention slavery. The very idea that such simple and clear language could be improved by adding the mention of slavery to it is incomprehensible to me. My understanding is that there is a desire by some to retain the language of slavery in our Constitution to enshrine the fact that Vermont was the first state to abolish slavery, setting aside very real questions about the degree to which Vermont truly and fully abolished slavery I think that it is time for us to stop clinging to that history, to stop patting ourselves on the back for that past, and start the very real and crucial work of addressing the racism that remains a part of our present day society and institutions. If we must hold on to that history, let's make sure we're holding on to our full history, both the grave wrongs committed and the acts of which we can all be proud. And let's remember that history in museums, or with plaques and statues, but not in our living constitution, the critical foundation of our current laws. There is so much important work to be done to address and dismantle racism in our state. One small piece of that work would be the full and complete elimination of slavery from our state constitution. I ask the committee to please restore the clean and simple language originally proposed for Proposal 2 and give us a clean constitution. Thank you. Thank you. And so would you be kind enough to submit yeah, that? I did drop yeah, it off right, and I'll right. get one job. Electronically for able yeah, to get it. Up next is 137, followed by 131. Good evening, Madam Chair and others. Um, my name is Rashita Butler, R-A-S-H-E-T-A. -E I am currently a Vermont Law School student, I'm a 3L, class graduate in May, originally from Chicago, Illinois. I do not have a prepared statement. However, I do want to voice my opinions on this matter, because um, I think it's important to have a voice. As stated earlier, I believe Section 2, Article 1 of the Constitutional Amendment um, that is up, the, eliminate, the language should be eliminated that says, unless bound by the person's own consent or bound by the payment of debts, damages, fines, costs, or the like, should be completely eliminated. And for the reasons that I heard tonight, um, and for the people who spoke before me, it is also known that prison is a form of slavery, if not a form of indentured servitude. We have prisoners who are mostly of color um, in prisons doing free labor. And I think the elimination of this section of, that, of the Constitutional um, Amendment in Article 1 is essential to accomplish that goal because it makes it apparent that Vermont will not stand for institutional racism to persist, especially in prisons. Thank you. 131. Hi there. Um, my name is Kathleen. Oh, yeah. 1.30 will be next. Sorry, that's okay. My name is Kathleen Boyd Walsh. Um, I have a written statement, I'm gonna you know, digress from it. Um, I'm very proud that my family is here with me. That's too much. Oh, it brought the average <laughs> 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 yes, Gabriel and um, Ruby and Maya are some of the reason I'm here. Um, I've, you know, had a lifelong sort of wanting to learn more about um, black culture and 
my bookshelf has always had those books that I never got around to reading, but my life has been an exploration of race and what it means to me and what it means in our society, more so now that I have such amazing and wonderful grandchildren. Um, I come here today on this 51st anniversary of the passing of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., because I want the beloved community to come and live here in Vermont. Um, uh, before he died, uh, he started to talk about poverty, and, um, and it, it, it is really true that uh, poverty is criminalized, and it's true in the words of the Constitution as well. And it's not okay. Um, I respectfully offer to you that it is past time for Vermont to finish the task of ensuring what we started in 1793, um, when our forebears, I should say forefathers, and they were white, and they were probably landed and wealthy, um, and that's worth making a note of, enacted Vermont's uh, state constitution. Um, I want to share with you, I've been trying to learn about um, race and our history, and uh, I learned something, I found it out recently, uh, I'm sorry I didn't, I wasn't able to do more research and give you more information about it, but, um, so 1612 is the year that sticks in my mind because I heard someone say it and I, I don't know for sure, but I think it might have been the date that um, the first ship landed with African Americans. I don't really know for sure, but I know that it was significant to the man who was saying it who was a black minister that I was listening to. Um, in uh, 1640, uh, the people in Virginia legally <coughs> sanctioned slavery for people of color. And they did that because uh, there was a court case where there were three indentured servants that ran away to Maryland from Virginia. And the three um, indentured servants were found to be guilty and all three were sentenced and the one African servant was sentenced to a full life of servitude. And the white um, servants were not. So whatever the rules were, I think it's great that Vermont did better than those rules, but the rules were, you know, those rules are still there and they're there for an economic reason. Um, our country has, I, I struck out of my <coughs> original notes a comment about who made the laws, and um, they were white people, they were white men, they were from someplace else, and this land wasn't theirs, and it wasn't free for the taking, but yet we took it, so all of that is part of it. Uh, but in 1640, when that uh, slavery was legally sanctioned, it was also the beginning of a rift between poor white people and poor black people, because the poor white people had one up on the poor black people now. Um, so it was really um, the beginning of racism. Um, I think that in Vermont, um, there might have been an intention. Um, Vermont was maybe trying to blaze a trail. But the cultural and economic underpinnings of slavery were still at play in, their, in them, in their lives. I mean, Rugby Museum, was owned by a gentleman who took in people who were fleeing slavery. But yet, when one of those people asked him, could you please pay my former master so that I can be free because I don't have the money even though I've worked really hard, they sent a letter t to the master, to the former owner, quote unquote owner, and, um, and that person said, no, you, that's not the market value of that, of that slave, and I will not take less than thus and such. And the Vermont owner would, uh, the Vermont person who was sheltering that enslaved person um, said, I'm sorry, my morals won't allow me to exchange money for a human life. He later regretted it, but the fact was that he still had that, he had a certain viewpoint in the world that didn't treat everyone the same. And his idea of what was right was his, and he had the freedom to do that. That's like me. I mean, I, I recently read a book by, um, you know, I don't the kids, Maya Angelou. And um, now I'm going to lose my train of thought, so okay, probably I should start reading it again. <laughs> um, 
She was heartbroken when Martin Luther King died. And when I read her autobiography, I realized I didn't have to be heartbroken. Um, so, back to my notes. When in um, 1793, Vermont was trying to blaze a trail, but we have exceptions in our Constitution when they wrote it, which you all know well. Our Constitution does not yet guarantee freedom for all. And as has been already said, neither does our federal Constitution. Um, so the conditions of poverty and whatever people decide is going to be criminalized our conditions of slavery is still um, nationally and or in Vermont. What I'm asking is simple. Do whatever you have to do now to make this keep on going because I know there are people who are going to grow up and I don't want them to have to fight this battle. Not when they're 12, not when they're 16, not when they're 20, not when they're, you know, as it has been. Prohibit slavery without exception. Give, especially give Vermonters the opportunity to heal the wounds that we still have of slavery that are hiding. And racism, its legacy, racism, it lives here. It's past time for us to do all that we can, and the Constitution needs to be changed. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for bringing Ben's back. <laughs> <laughs> Such a treat. Up next is 1.30 to be followed by 1.38. We've done this. We don't have any more um, tickets in here, so Peggy can give you a ticket if you want, or if you don't have one, we will still have some time and we'll take other people. So, you know. Thanks. Good evening. Thank you very much for having this hearing. My name is Sylvia Knight, K N I G H T. I live in Burlington, Vermont. Proposition 2 provides a unique moment in history when we can begin to rectify the troubling and damaging legacy of slavery in our country. It is time to make certain that the Vermont Constitution, the basis of our laws, does not in any way provide a basis for inequity or inequality between persons or groups of people. Since the 1960s, I've become painfully aware of the effects of inequity and racism on myself, my family, and on my brothers and sisters of color. As whites, we participate in implicit bias and benefit from institutionalized racial inequity. It is ingrained in our laws, institutions, and cultures. Slavery and racism based in the social construct of white supremacy has been perpetuated in Jim Crow, lynching, mass incarcerations of black and brown people, and de jure segregation not de facto, de jure, based on laws. In Vermont, we have seen neighborhoods with restrictive covenants, failure to protect black people in Vermont from racial harassment, and criminalization of black and brown people with unequal treatment before the law. As our nation was built, uh, uh, would also include in that the criminalization of our immigrant farm workers. As our nation was built on systemic racism and inequality based on law, we must remove the legal basis for inequality and systemic racism in order to create racial justice in Vermont. Healing cannot happen without movement toward justice. In the 
Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948, signed by the United States, we read, recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. The amended version of PR2, beginning with, therefore, no person uh, born in this country, still maintains references to conditions of inequality that are not clear or helpful in moving toward uh, racial equity and justice. So I urge that you adopt language suggested by Peter Teachout, such as adding after the word therefore, adding slavery and indentured servitude in any form are prohibited, and omitting the remaining language. Um, I would also accept us going forward with the, the original um, Prop 2, I, for me, this makes it clearer. Uh, so please help us to amend our, our Constitution so that it upholds the principle of inherent dignity and equal inalienable rights for all. Thank you for Thank you. having this hearing. Thank you. So the last ticket I have is 138.
when it's worded well and the potential problems when it isn't world, uh, worded well. Um, we want to be able to trust um, our courts that interpret the law. They base it on the Constitution, so wording is really important. Um, I read the first proposal um, submitted by um, Senator Ingram and others and thought it was great. It was clean, clear, and um, understandable and not subject to um, potential problems. And then when I read the revised version, um, I don't feel the language is clear. I don't feel that it's clean. I, uh, I, was, I was typing this out and the word holding came up and there's, that's not in the um, dictionary on my phone anymore. I mean, there's like the language is older. It might be in line with other in the Constitution, but it's not clear. And when we get to the, <coughs> The part that's left in about um, unless bound by laws for payment of debts, damages, fines, costs, and the like, um, could we say that someone be, is bound by law to be a servant or apprentice because they have a debt, because they have the life? I would like to think we wouldn't get into, you know, that we think we know that what, what that means, and it's all right if the wording is a little unclear, but I don't trust that anymore. Uh, and I think we have to be very, very careful. Uh, so I support returning to the language of the original proposal, and particularly if, if, if there has to be some compromise, removing that unclear language. And, and I do see this as um, important, not only the, the importance of the law being clear, but also, uh, you know, we're, racism has never been gone in this country or in this state. We happen to be in a time where um, uh, it is, there are more, there's more blatant acts being um, identified and more, I think, you know, hopefully a growing sense that we need to address this within our state government, within our institutions of society. And um, I look to the leadership of people of color and what it means to them and that we should be listening and understanding that. Um, and I think that we need to use we can use the clarity of this language and a, and a uh, statement of changing the Constitution as a basis for showing our commitment to understanding um, the systems of racism in our state and how we can address that. And I um, urge returning to that language. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Number 139. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak. Um, my name is Rachel Wilson. I live in Woodbury, Vermont. Um, I ran a social justice group at a high school in Hardwick, Vermont for four years. I have done a lot of racial justice work in the state through the Peace and Justice Center. And um, I'm just here to speak on behalf of the young students of color who are here in the state of Vermont and people of color, I just want to say that having any language that keeps slavery in the Vermont Constitution sends a very clear message to the people of color that we are not safe in Vermont, that um, 
justice it may not be served to us. And I have to say that I have seen so many instances of racism in schools that have just been swept under the rug. And so time and again, we see that we're not being supported in the state of Vermont. And when we stand up, there's always backlash. And people of color move to Vermont, and then a lot of them leave because they don't feel that they have the support of the community and of, of the state behind them. And I know just firsthand after doing all of this work around racial justice, um, feeling the effects of the backlash and the emotional and mental stress and strain and uh, trauma that it causes um, has made me want to leave the state. And I feel that I have a lot to offer to the people of Vermont and I want to stay here and I think that the people who are in power and are in positions of power need to make sure that a message is sent that the people of color in Vermont are going to be safe and that we're all going to be safe, that any language that has to do with slavery needs to be removed from our constitution. And I am, thank you just here as a mother and a concerned person and thank you for hearing me. Anybody else? So <clears throat> the committee will continue to discuss this and take your comments into consideration. And <clears throat> I would suggest that you also watch our um, web, the website for our committee to see when we take it up next because we will, we will continue this conversation. And, and when you come, if you come to the committee, um, as some of you know, it's a little less formal and we can actually have conversations with you and ask you, what about this? Or how would you do this? Or can you explain this? So I would encourage you to come when we take this up again. And remember that <clears throat> this, just one second, this does not, this has until May of 2020 in, to pass both chambers. So we want to get it right. We don't want to rush it. We want to make sure we get it right. So did you have a question? What time of day are you regular? Right we are an afternoon committee, so we meet. Um, typically, we should meet from 1 until about 4.30 or 5, but oftentimes, we're on the floor on Wednesdays and Thursdays. We're on the floor at one o'clock. So sometimes we don't get done until later, but it will be on our calendar. But we are an afternoon committee. And if you have testimony or additional thoughts, um, if you get uh, Gail's email, please send them to us. Yes. We would appreciate having any testimony. Uh, and, and if you send it straight to Gail, it, goes, it mm -hmm. comes to us. Mm -hmm. Mark. I'm Madam Chair, I just want to thank you for uh, taking the time tonight. I think there's a lot of people in the room that would have never had the opportunity to voice, to uh, have their voices heard. So it, it is, it's a really big deal to me as well that you uh, took the time, your time, to do this uh, this evening. Um, so thank you very much for that. That was a two-way street. We appreciate you guys. Yeah. And, and also, just the, the, the last point is simply that just inherent in the very nature of what we're talking about when we start when we're talking about poverty when we're talking about criminalization of poverty and you know this ties into it is when can we show up because a lot of us we just can't show up you know and it's, it's so important and you know, if we would have had it a little bit later you probably would have had some more folks out but thanks for making the effort but and also remember that you can always send us written testimony and if you have something when we have some anything on the the calendar, you can also testify testify by phone. You can talk to us by phone because we understand that um, not everybody circles around this building every day like we do. So feel free to um, ask to testify by phone if you would like to. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.